Great to be here. I've heard about this place thing for the last three or four years, but this is my first year here. I am a INR4 virgin. So we're going to pop my cherry here today. <laughs> and I do have to say thanks to Bill, thanks to everybody. This is an amazing convention. I really underestimated what was going to happen when I came here. I met the coolest people, met people from farther away than Kansas City. I can't believe that. Uh, what's, a, what's that lake? Baker Lake. Who's the Baker Lake guy here? Where are you? There you are. Baker Lake is farther from here than Kansas City is. That's just mind-boggling. So I have to first of all begin with a little paid political announcement. As uh, many of you know, I started the organization Recovering from Religion. We're now an international organization in five different countries. If you are interested, please get online. Look at recoveringfromreligion.org. We are helping thousands of people get into the free thought movement. People don't want to come to an atheist meeting when they just walked out of church. They need somewhere to go to talk about how do I deal with my religious husband? How do I talk to my, my kids? I raised them Christian and now, I'm an a and now I'm not Christian anymore. They need a place to go and talk and the skeptics group and the atheist group isn't necessarily the best place to go. But if you come to our meeting for two or three months, you will then be an atheist ready to go to the skeptics. We are the stepping stone to atheism and we're bringing all sorts. Our motto is there are thousands of groups, pe that, groups that will get you into religion. We're the only one that will help you out of religion. And I am so proud to announce uh, that last month our executive director, Sarah Moorhead out of Omaha, Nebraska. Wait a minute, how'd we get that? <laughs> that that's one step. Sarah was named Atheist of the Year at the American Atheist Convention last month. Thanks. Yeah, we are, we are so pumped about Sarah. She's been our executive director for two or three years now, and she kicks butt. I mean, this next week we're having a huge debate. Uh, Matt Dillahunty against Ty somebody. I don't know who it is. Uh, Christian apologist, obviously in Memphis, and you know, we've got a nice venue there, we have, uh, we're selling tickets, so if you're in Memphis area, come watch this debate. All right, so let's move on, let's talk about sex. This is the original artwork, uh, before the Pope got in and, uh, and censored, <laughs> censored it. Let's, and uh, many of you probably don't know that I am the high priest of the Church of the Flying Spaghetti Monster, yeah. Uh, and that is uh, his, my noodly appendage right here. That's an exact replica of what's underneath the gown, by the way. So if you need a blessing from me, uh, come and I can help you with that. So uh, when I was beginning to write my, my latest book, Sex and God, I needed to do some research. Because what I found out is nobody's ever asked an atheist about their sex lives. And I thought, well, somebody will at least ask. Before I write this whole book, uh, I need to find out, and nobody had ever done it, so I did it with the help of Amanda Brown, and that's what we're going to talk about today. If you're interested in the research, there's several places you can find out. The one you can buy my book, unfortunately, I'm sold out. I, I don't have any left uh, of Sex and God. We've got a few God virus back there. But uh, you can go online. You can download the full report that you're going to see here today at ipcpress.com. Free download. Just download it. There's so much cool information. We're only going to get to talk about a tiny bit of it today. Or you can go look at uh, Dawkins' documentary, Sex, Death, and the Meaning of Life. And he interviewed me with, uh, with respect to our research. And it's a really cool documentary because, not just because I'm in it, of course, but because he sets it all up so sweetly. And these fundamentalists are talking about all the horrible things sex does to you. And then Dawkins switches to my research and we talk about the beauty of being an atheist. So today we're going to, here's my two objectives and hopefully we'll get through it all. I want to give you an overview of the research itself. And then I want to talk a little bit about its implications for your life. But before I do that, I have a very serious question I need to ask. I want you to think carefully about it and answer honestly. I masturbate. How many of you masturbate? <laughs> Whoa, good, good, good. Not many liars in this group. Thank goodness. All right. <laughs> so imagine, one of, my, one of the things I wanted to, wanted to demonstrate and show you today is the same thing that Dan Barker came to uh, Reason Fest in Lawrence, Kansas a month or two ago. When was that? Dan is about a... Uh, where did Dan go? Anyway, a couple months ago, and one of Dan's theses in the debate was 
that Christians lie about things. And they lie about a lot of things, one of which is church attendance. And I noticed in Hemet Mehta's uh, blog just yesterday, there was a new Pew study that shows uh, Christians overestimate their church attendance or overreport their church attendance by twice. Dan said the same thing. Well, uh, I've, I've established that Christians lie about other things besides their church attendance. Christians lie about masturbation. How many, if I went to a Baptist church and said, how many of you masturbate, how many hands do you think I would see? <laughs> At that debate with Dan Bar Barker, they had a question and answer period, which is dangerous when there's a minister and me around. And I got up and I asked, do you masturbate? And you know what he said? I plead the Fifth Amendment. <laughs> so here's a young 35-year-old handsome guy with a beard, and he's not going to tell me if he masturbates or not. So we did a lot of research on this, and what we found is if you ask a Mormon, if you ask a Catholic, if you ask a Baptist, they will deny in public, they will deny they masturbate, and yet I see 80% of the hands went up here today. So, bio, masturbation is a biological imperative. And you know something? You are the first sex partner you're ever going to have. You may be the last sex partner you're ever going to have. <laughs> so get used to it. Enjoy it. And how in hell do you expect other people to give you an orgasm if you can't give yourself an orgasm? So here's the result of, we ask, we ask a wide range, thousands and thousands of people why they masturbate, uh, and here's, here's the breakdown, mainly between men and women. have a rather perverted view of masturbation. And I want to show you, I want to show you what one of the top evangelical fundamentalist Christians, Mike Driscoll, who preaches at Mars Hill, says about masturbation. Masturbation can be a form of homosexuality because it is a sexual act that does not involve a woman. If a man were to notice what, ladies, you get off scot-free here, by the way. If a man were to masturbate, while engaged in other forms of sexual intimacy with his wife, then he would not be doing so in a homosexual way. However, any man who does so without his wife in the room is bordering on homosexual activity, particularly if he's watching himself in the mirror and being turned on by his own male body. I never thought of that until I read this. I tried it, doesn't work too well, at least for me. Amazing that this guy has that kind of attitude about masturbation, and you don't think he masturbates? Right. So, how many of you believe and are perfectly fine with premarital sex? How many of you had premarital sex? All right. If I ask that question in a Baptist church, you know damn good and well, 90 to 95 percent of those people had premarital sex. Now, it may have been with the person they married, but it was still premarital sex. So you see, Christians and religious people of all sorts lie about their sexuality. Imagine if your whole relationship starts with a lie. You, you can't tell your spouse that you've had three sex partners before you got married, or 23. I don't care, really. It doesn't matter to me. So, <laughs> Mormons, Baptists, Muslims, Catholics, Hindus, it doesn't matter. All of them lie about it because that's against their religion, and yet they do it. So what we wanted to look, look at was some of that behavior uh, using this research. So religious live a lie. They, don't, they pretend like they don't masturbate. They claim they never had premarital sex. They pretend like they don't use pornography. Right. And they condemn others for what they themselves are doing. Atheists don't seem to have that problem. I can ask that question here, and I'll get lots of ha questions, uh, hands raised on the questions I've asked here. So Amanda and I, Amanda was an uh, undergraduate, she's now a graduate student in uh, social work at the University of Kansas, wanted to, wanted to do some research and find out what happens when you leave religion. Want to look at what happens before you leave religion, what happens after, to your sex life. And nobody's ever looked at this question before. So we did this research by asking the atheist blogging community to to get the word out, and I have to say thanks to all these people, Greta Christina and P.Z. Myers, Jen McCright, uh, and the American Atheist, they helped us a lot, uh, the Atheist Experience, you've all seen Atheist Experience, I'm thinking, and there were just many, many more, I couldn't even begin to thank all of them, but these, <laughs> when P.Z. put it up, it went, it like tripled overnight, the number of responses. We ended up getting 14,560 participants uh, who started the survey, 
and almost exactly 10,000 participants that completed it. And it was 69 questions. That was an accident, by the way. We, that was totally an accident. So we got 69 different questions answered by, uh, by these, these folks. When I released it, it went viral. Wait a, wait a minute, it went viral. And Greta Christina wrote a great article, a critical article. She pointed out the, the um, problems with this kind of research. We didn't claim it was perfect research, uh, but it was a great article. Greta really captured the essence of what we were trying to do in the research. It made the Daily Mail, it made the New York Post, thousands of news outlets. And I do have to thank Greta for being very supportive about it and getting, helping us get the word out. And then I came back from Europe, Judy and I were in Europe, and we got back, and the day I got back, I got an email from a friend that says, do you realize you're in Playboy magazine? I said, no, do I have my clothes on? And, and it turned out we got a little uh, three inch, I know it doesn't sound very big, but a three inch uh, uh, news item in Playboy magazine. Because, you know, we had nobody ever asked atheists about their sex lives. Here's the hypotheses we were testing in our, in our research. Uh, is we wanted to look at religion's use of sexual guilt. Is it measurable? Can you look at it? And is it greater in conservative or more liberal religions? Uh, we want people feel sexual guilt uh, taught by their religion, but is that, does it show up in their behavior? Can you see a difference in sexual behavior despite the sexual guilt, or because of the sexual guilt. Uh, religiously conservative parents, we want to ask, are they less or more effective at teaching their children about sex and sexuality? And uh, children raised in highly religious homes, we, we uh, hypothesize that they would reach, receive poor sexual education. And people who leave religion, we were hypothesizing that there would be a positive impact on their sexual satisfaction and that religion has a, but number six hypothesis was that religion would have a continuing negative consequence on individuals after they left on their sex lives. So those are the six hypotheses. We're actually not going to go through all six of those. We don't have time today. We're going to just hit some of the highlights. But before we do that, we collected tons of information. This wasn't, it was, it was cool because, you know, we're, we're talking about sex, but there's a lot of other things we collected, like what, what religion were you raised in? How much guilt were you taught in that religion? Lots of things we learned about people. And people told us their life stories. We gave everybody a chance. Every question had like one to ten on it, maybe, but every question also had the opportunity to, to tell us things, to type it. People wrote their life story and pasted it in here, I think. Uh, four and five pages sometimes. We got 4,000 pages of comments from this, from this survey. We still have not read all the comments. It's just overwhelming how much information. People were ready to tell us about uh, what religion had done to their sex lives. So before you, before you became non-religious, what religion were you? And this is a breakdown. I know it's kind of tiny. It's hard to see, but there's 28 different religions we identified that had enough in our surveyed to do it, beginning with uh, a very tiny 4.4% were Seventh-day Adventists, clear up to 19.7% uh, were Catholics, uh, Christian non-denominational were about 14.4%. What we found was our, our distribution is about the same as it is in the, in the greater United States. I'm going to come back and talk about Canada just a little bit. But the distribution you see here, with one exception, is about what it is uh, across the United States in terms of religiosity, which tells us, that, yeah, these people were formerly religious and now they're atheists, but they still represent, they're pretty representative of the religious landscape in the United States. So uh, Catholics are about 20, 21% of uh, population in the United States, and here they show up at 19.7%. Christian non-denominational is 14.3%. They're actually a little overrepresented in our survey. And Baptists are about, it's about right for what, what uh, we see in the population. Uh, now, we ask, okay, what are you now? And almost exactly 80% told us they're now atheists. But others, I mean, some didn't tell us at all. Others uh, said these other things in completing the survey. So that's the way it works. Now, internationally, we were a little afraid because we were really focused on the United States. That's what we really wanted to know. Because we're, the United States is the craziest religious country on the planet, I think, outside of Saudi Arabia, maybe, or Pakistan. Uh, but here's what we got in the breakdown. The majority of our respondents were U.S., but we did have the second largest Canadians, not surprising. People are 
close to us. We got quite a few, but the problem was we didn't get enough Canadians to break it down too much. Our biggest concern was all these international people were going to screw up our results. Uh, and uh, so we really looked, we separated this group, everybody, from the uh, U.S. results. And what we found was you did screw our results up. You are a lot less guilty than the rest of the United States is. So, so we didn't take anything out. We left this whole group together. Logistically, technically, it didn't make sense to pull all these out for a lot of reasons. And if you want to know the reasons afterwards, I'll be glad to tell you. So, but we left it all together. And the problem is that these people are much more sexually liberal than these people are. So as I go through the statistics today, you're going to see some statistics that are just going to maybe take your breath away. Well, they're even worse than they look at up here because of all you Canadians that are out there having orgies every weekend, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so one of the things I want to do is test, uh, test the guilt cycle. In, in both of my books, I, I talk about the guilt cycle. It's a psychological concept, a very simple concept, that religion teaches you uh, guilt and then uses that against you. It's a simple concept that works like this. When you're a little kid, your mom says, don't put your hand in the cookie jar and get a cookie before your meal. Let's spoil your meal. One day, you put your hand in the cookie jar, you eat it, your mom catches you, she slaps your hand and says, don't do that. So you get the behavior, you know, the tension, the appetite, cookies sure taste good, the behavior, uh, uh, you engage in eating cookie, then you feel guilty about it because your mom told you not to put your hand in the cookie jar. So in psychology, we call that cognitive dissonance. I mean, the lay term is guilt, but it's really cognitive dissonance. Mom gave me this rule, here's my behavior. The conflict comes out as dissonance. Well, the religion comes along and says, ah, but we can teach you what to be guilty of. We can teach you that you should do as God commands. When you break a commandment, you disappoint God, and then you've got to do something to get forgiveness. And, you know, uh, you can only go about a, uh, so long before you have to, you know, have sex with your boyfriend again, or have or masturbate again, or look at pornography again, or whatever. So there's really a, a cycle of, of guilt that comes, that, that comes with religion. So religion says you feel the tension around sex, you engage in the behavior, then you feel the guilt. But, oh, if you just come back to church, if you go to confession, if you read your Bible, if you go to Sunday school, we can forgive you. <sighs> Relief. We had, a, we had a Catholic priest in our recovering from religion group about three years ago. He came in and told us his story. He'd gone through eight years of seminary, eight years. And he said, I could go about a month without masturbating, and then I'd jack off. Now, I'm, oh, I'm going to go to hell. So he'd have to go find a priest and confess to the priest, who himself had probably masturbated that morning. <laughs> <sighs> relief. So he gets relief. He can go about another month. Towards the end of his work in seminary, just before he's getting ready to go and become a real priest, he goes to the zoo, and he sees the chimpanzees masturbating. And he thinks, the Pope believes, this is back in the Pope day, the earlier Pope days, uh, Pope believes in evolution. I believe in evolution. Those guys are related to me, and they masturbate. What's wrong with me masturbating? And he said that was the first step towards being an atheist for him. A visit to the zoo, <laughs> watching the chimps masturbate. I don't know if he's into bestiality or not, but that seems to be a fun story. So let's talk about sex and the God virus. Um, putting these two together, there's, this comes from a songwriter, uh, Butch Hancock, who's a profound philosopher. We've always heard some philosophers in here already, but I think Butch is even better than the philosophers we've heard. Uh, sorry about that, guys. Uh, Christopher, wherever you are, you're number two. And uh, so here's, here's Butch Hancock. Life in Lubbock, Texas taught me two things. One, that God loves you, and you're going to burn in hell. <laughs> the other is that sex is the most awful, dirty thing on the face of the earth, and you should save it for someone you love. <laughs> How many of you are raised with that message in your home? Yeah, okay, about a third of the people in the room. All right, so... Is there a difference in how religions use guilt? I wanted to look at that because a big part in both of my books is talking about how religions use guilt, not just sexual guilt, but other kinds of guilt. So what we were asking is, what religion were you before you became atheist, and how much guilt were you taught within the concept, confines of that religion? And it sounds interesting. It sounds really cool. We could, we could cross those two questions together, and we came up 
with the most sexually guilty religions in, that you would commonly find in the United States. So before I show you the graph, I want to ask, if you've seen this before, don't answer this question. How many, what, what would you guess is the most sexually guilty religion commonly found in North America? Catholics, okay. How many, just raise your hand, Catholic. How many say Catholic? Okay. Uh, let me hear another guess. Baptist? How many say Baptist? Okay. How many say Mormons? I heard Mormons. Okay. The Mormons are right. You are the most guilty group in the United States around sexuality. Look at this. We got the Mormons right here at number one. We got the Jehovah's Witnesses. You guys back there? Jehovah's Witnesses. Number two, Pentecostals, Jerry DeWitt. Thank goodness he's left there. And uh, Seventh-day Adventists. Any Seventh-day Adventists, former Seventh-day Adventists in here? No, no, they're, they're all over Kansas City where I live. Their headquarters is just down south of, of where I live. So look at that. You can see that clearly those four are clearly above everybody else. And here's the poor Catholics. They're losing out in the guilt area. I think we got a lot of cafeteria Catholics. It's hard to tell, you know. But the, the beautiful thing about this graph is you can just see that there's a clear difference in what kind of guilt people are being taught as children. And nobody's ever looked at this and said, okay, are Catholics really the worst or Jehovah's Witnesses worst? And is there really a guilt in the Methodist Church or not? We're not sure. The Episcopalians appear to have very little guilt. And if you look down here, agnostics and atheists are down at the bottom, but look who's lower than us. Unitarians and the Jews. Wow. Yeah, Unitarians. So I was at uh, Skepticon a couple years ago, and I showed this dad up here, and they had a whole row of Unitarians in the back there. And they just started cheering. I didn't know who they were. They started cheering. <laughs> okay, afterwards I asked them, why are you guys lower than us? Why are you less guilty about sex than we are? And they told me we've got this great program called, program called All Our Lives. It's age-appropriate, sex-positive education for children of every age. And everybody's it's available up to adulthood at, at Unitarian Church. I think, I don't have any place as an atheist to send my kids or grandkids to get good sex-positive education. I didn't even know about the Unitarian. So I'm telling you now, if you do want to send your kids to church, send them to the Unitarian Church and get, get their sex education because they're apparently is doing more than what we're doing as atheists over here. Uh, but I, I, I love my Unitarian friends and they've really got some good stuff. Uh, the very, very, very liberal Church of Christ uh, group, that's not this one here, uh, also participates in that particular educational program. So I have evidence. I think this is one of the cool things about our research. We have evidence that the Unitarian's sex education system is probably working. In that, I know it's independent, they didn't pay me a dime, but it's independent research that shows that sex positive education reduces sexual guilt. And I don't think we see a lot of rapists among the Unitarians, do you? Are they having, or maybe they're having orgies, but they're having positive orgies, and really, <laughs> is that what you guys are doing up here in Canada? Because you were, a lot, you were pretty low on this list. If I broke it down by nationality, Canada would be pretty low in sexual guilt. So the, what, what we found in our particular research was the fastest growing religions, the ones that are also most cult-like, uh, use guilt the most, the most guilty religions. You look on this survey, and <laughs> Buddhists are not growing really fast in the United States. Episcopalians are dying quickly in the United States. I mean, all these liberal churches are dying in the United States, in, in North America for sure. And the more, the ones, the one, the few religions that are growing are usually the most guilt and shame based ones. So, and this just comes from the last, uh, Betty Bowers, you all know Betty Bowers. <laughs> it, the highest Google searches for homosexual sex during the election cycle come from all these states. Of course, it's not surprising, Nevada, but wow, look at all that. And remember one of those states voted for a good old Mitt who doesn't masturbate. All right, so does religious guilt actually stop behavior or change behavior? So I did another research online, and here's what I found. <laughs> I'm glad he finally found the guy he was looking for. So let's look, this is a little bit complicated graph right here. This comes straight out. It's, it's complicated, but there's a lot of information, real interesting here. What we wanted to do is find out if the sexual behavior was really different because people are being taught something when they're children, when they're very young. And did that teaching have any impact on their actual sexual behavior? So here we're taking the 14,560 people and we're breaking it down into three groups and we're eliminating the middle group. 
we're, the, those people who are kind of in the middle, we're just cutting those out. And we're looking at the extremes, which is still several thousands of people, five to 8,000 people in these two groups out here. We split them out, and we're looking at uh, were they uh, the religious and the non, the most religious? We ask how religious, how, how how religious were you in your home of origin? A one to ten. If you scored an eight, nine, or a ten, you're going to get put in the highly religious group. If you scored a one, two, or three, you're going to be put in the very uh, non-religious group. And we're just looking at the difference. What kind of teaching? How how were you taught at that age? And what was your behavior? So what we find was uh, when did when did uh, how many of you were masturbating at uh, at 15 years of age. And we see that 83% of our respondents who were very religious were masturbating at age 15. 86.7% were masturbating at age 15. There's 3.7% difference between the kids who had it beat into their heads since they were born, the masturbation is wrong, and the atheist or the highly secular or the very, very non-religious kids in our sample. So far, we see very little difference between these two groups. Petting. Now, for those of you who are my age, I know what petting is, but it's getting in the back seat of the car and doing everything except fucking. All right, that's, that's, you guys know about petting up here in Canada? I did a lot of it when I was in high school. And uh, look, there's not much difference between the two groups. Not much difference at all. There is some difference. All these kids are saying you gotta save it, uh, for marriage, you're probably, uh, at this point in time, it looks to me like having anal sex instead of penis and vagina sex. That seems to be what the purity culture does to kids. Oral sex, they are sucking each other off. Look at this. 18 to 20 percent. There's only a, a 1.4 percent difference between the religious kids and the non-religious kids at age 15. Actually having penis and vagina intercourse, or maybe there's some other stuff there going on there, is hardly any difference at this age. This is age 15. Look what happens in religious kids <coughs> at, at 18. By age 18, we see 90% of religious kids, many of whom have probably taken the purity thing or majigger and married their father or whatever they do at those events, <laughs> and they're still 90% are masturbating, and 92.8% of, of, of secular kids are masturbating. Petting, not much here, not much difference here. Intercourse. Now there is a 9% difference in intercourse. So what we do know, and, and the, the interesting thing about our research is it parallels almost identically to the Pew, to the ARIS survey, to the Gutmaker Institute. There's been a lot of research on when kids start having sex. Nobody's, nobody's correlated it with religiosity. Nobody's ever done that before. So what we are doing is we're looking at religiosity and sex. When, at the onset of sexual activity. And what we found is our data parallels exactly what the Pew and the heiress and the, and the gut maker and, and many other uh, pieces of research over the last 20 years have shown. Kids are gonna have sex, whether they have a purity ring on their hand or not, they're going to have sex of some kind. So, but we do see an 11% or so difference in 18 year olds who are actually having sexual intercourse right here. There is a difference. And in the Pew, uh, in the uh, ERA survey, what they found was, yes, young kids are having sex, or kids are having sex at 18. There's a difference, though. These kids told us they used condoms because their parents taught them how to do it. These kids said, I had sex without condoms. In the, and, and, I, and generally speaking, uh, kids who start having sex from a religious family start about three to four months later than the kids who come from non-religious families. Three to four months is all that's delayed by all that guilt stuff that, uh, that is being taught. So, not much difference, but they, they do catch up. You look down here, look at that. Not much difference in actual intercourse by the time they're 21 years of age. And heck, they're all jacking off by this time, right here. They're having a, the religious kids are taught and told you should not be masturbating, and yet look at them doing that. I, I studied with the great psychotherapist Albert Ellis um, in my early training, and Albert had a famous saying. He said, 97% of men uh, will admit to masturbating, and the other 3% are lying. And, and that looks like pretty much what we've got here. Actually, the results are more like 97, not 93% of men, but 
And women, we know women don't masturbate quite as much, and there's good biological reasons for both men and women to masturbate. There's also biological reasons why men would masturbate more than women. But women tend to masturbate about 70%. And oh, by the way, this includes males and females all through here, so we're not pulling those two out. Although we did in our research, you can download that and look at it. So where do you get your sexual information? That was another thing we wanted to know. Uh, religious people insist uh, that doing, um, doing their own st on, on doing sex education at home. You know, I don't want anybody teaching my kids in school about sex or sex education. I'm going to do it at home. So what we asked was, well, are they doing it at home? And there's other research um, that has shown, that looked at our parents, our parents educating their children at home who resist and, and, and don't want them having it at school. So our, again, our research can be paralleled or put up against other research. The, our research is not randomized, so that's a big criticism, and, and we don't have any problems with that. There's very, very few good, I mean, what if I called you up, and you're a good Catholic, and I said, would you like to take a survey on sex? How many times did you masturbate this week? <laughs> Click. So there's almost no way to have randomized research on human sexuality, because it's going to get skewed. The really religious people are going to hang up on you. They're not going to fill out the form or whatever. So what we're doing is we're comparing people when they were still religious with, with uh, where they are now, for example, or what happened to them after they left religion. So that's one way to kind of get at what happens to people around religiosity and sexuality. So let's begin with the uh, least religious people. These are the people who are uh, being raised by libertine parents who are telling them condoms work and you should not, you know, you should have sex when you're ready for it. But, you know, these are, these are religious parents oftentimes, but they're liberal religious parents. And, and here's what the kids report to us. They said, I got my sex education 75% from friends and peers. That's a lot. Doesn't surprise me. That's where I got a lot of my sex education. I'm guessing a lot of you did too. Uh, 42%, now you could answer multiple things on here. Uh, so 42% said, I learned from uh, experience. That is getting in the back seat of a car or in the back of the theater back there and, and doing something, okay? So you learn from that. 38% of these kids that are in liberal families say their parents gave them good sex education. 38%, that is piss poor. That is really bad, don't you think? I mean, I would, I would like to see that these are, some of these are even atheist parents. They're certainly secular, more secular parents. I'd like to see that way up there. I learned it from uh, the internet. 27% of secular kids learned it from the internet. And uh, I learned it from pornography. 25% are getting online and looking at pornography and that's where they're getting their sex education. So, <coughs> this, is, this is the least, kids raised in the least religious homes in our, in our survey. Now let's look at kids raised in the most religious homes. You might want to remember the top three or four here, all right? So where did the most religious kids get their sex education? Uh, I'm sorry, so those are the top ones. Uh, experience, parents, and porn. Religious kids, 70% said they got it from friends. In the previous one, it was 75%, so it's pretty close. So what's the number two? Experience. What was it in the last slide? Yeah. So there's about a 7% difference. In other words, religious kids are getting in the back seat and doing it after the purity ball, I'm guessing, probably. <laughs> Did you see what was going on out there, those sexy Catholic girls walking around? I saw two Catholic girls holding hands as they walked up and down the hall. They, they held hands all the way that way and all the way back. Now, if it was two Catholic guys, I'm thinking there would have been a problem. Why did they let Catholic girls hold hands? I don't know. Anyway, something else was going on there. Uh, number two is porn. Three. Third in the list is 33%. Now, our friends, our, our liberal kids, were getting their information from porn. Uh, I think it was about 27% in the previous slide. Now, here's 33%. In other words, religious kids are using porn even more than non-religious kids, but not a lot more. And, of course... Parents, look at this. Religious kids are getting their sex education 13.5% from their parents. That is really piss poor. Now, I told you that we allowed people to give us information, type in information. So we, we dove down into this particular group and said, well, let's look at what they said about their parents. 
get education. What they said was, my parents taught me that I shouldn't have sex before marriage and I shouldn't use condoms. And if you get pregnant, it's your own downfall and, uh, and abortion is bad and all this sort of stuff. So even the education that kids are getting in religious homes is non-scientific, non-valid, non-emotion-based, non-age-appropriate kinds of sex education. We can see a very clear difference in this research between the kids raised most research, raised most um, religious, and the kids raised least religious. All right, so even, in, and I've, I've mentioned many other researches uh, that's been done None of our research contradicts previous research. There's nothing in any of the major surveys. That con the only difference is we're looking at religiosity and they're not. The strongest, this comes out of a 2011 um, uh, University of Georgia, which is in the south of the United States. Uh, states with the strongest policy and budget emphasis on absence-only education also have the highest rates of sexually transmitted infections and teen pregnancies. This is true even after controlling for socioeconomic status, education, and other variables. Our research seems to show the same kind of thing. Kids are having sex, but they're having unprotected sex because their parents haven't taught, taught them. Now, now that you're non-religious, how has your life changed from a scale of one to 10? After I did this uh, presentation a few times, this lady sent me this particular video, uh, not video, this particular uh, visual that I think will help you understand when she left religion, what happened to her sex life? Uh, let's. <laughs> and that was before I started giving the vibrators away for book sales. How many of you got a vibrator in here from me? I gave about 12 of them away. There you go. We have happy people in here. Hopefully you used them last night. All right, so on a scale of 1 to 10, and I ran out, sorry, I was, no more vibrators. I usually give a vibrator out if you buy two of my books, but we're all out today. Okay, so how has your sex life changed on a scale of one to 10? Uh, greatly improved or much, much worse. And what we found was 54.6% of the people said their sex life had improved an eight, nine, or a 10 after leaving religion. Now that's pretty in in interesting, but over the here, these are all Unitarians here. Nothing happened when they left, or Episcopalians, or even some of the Methodists. Nothing happened when they left, when they left religion. But 2.2% said, my sex life got a lot worse. And once again, we drilled down into the comments. We want to know what's going on. What makes it worse? One guy said, I told my wife I'm an atheist, and now she says I can't sleep with you. I can't go to bed with somebody who doesn't share my faith. Another kid, 26, 27-year-old guy, uh, said, I used to bed every, be able to bed every girl in the Sunday school class, and now that I'm an atheist, they won't talk to me. <laughs> they will screw him. All these Christian girls will screw him all day long, as long as he's still a Christian. All right, so. <laughs> and we got all sorts of comments like that. The, the comments that we, we got in our uh, research were just amazing. It was fun to read, because people were so open and free about it, because they're, they're out of religion now. But they told us some horrendous stories. We, ta we heard... Uh, kids say, I was beaten bloody by my parents when they caught me masturbating. I was grounded in the house for weeks after the, my parents caught me kissing a boy. You know, stuff like that. It's just uh, abusive. We, we got a lot of things that, that bordered, I think, on, on abuse. So, after, after religion, uh, okay, now what religion were you most, did, did we see the most improvement in your sex life? And this is a list. I mean, these people up here have been, always been atheists. These are the people that we're talking about. Uh, Dan was talking about, you knew you were an atheist when you were six years old. We did get a, a good deal of those kind of people in our survey. So they kind of give us a baseline. But look down here. When you leave Jehovah's Witnesses, you are going nuts. You are having sex <laughs> so much more. Look at that on a scale. Nine point. That's a really fun. I want to I meet some ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Where's the orgy tonight, all right? And the Mennonites, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, Pentecostals. We saw all those others in the previous guilt. So they had the most guilt when they were in religion and when they left religion. And remember, these questions are separated sometimes by 10, 10 or 15 questions later. It's not like they're relating these things. They're just saying, how much has your sex life improved since you left religion? And those are the answers we get. So uh, where's the Catholics on that one? There they are. Catholics are kind of middle of the road. But it did improve a lot, I mean, compared to some of these others. So 
uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, the big ones, Seventh-day Adventists, and, uh, and uh, Pentecostals. All right. So now, now we wanted to know where you, where you get your sexual entertainment. That was important to us. When you, know, when do you, when you want to get entertained, where do you go for it? And so we looked first at women. And there was about 4,000 women in our survey. And here we're putting everybody back together. We're throwing them all in the pot again. You're an atheist now. What do you do when you want some sexual entertainment? Women told us that they like erotic novels, number one. Women like to read. Uh, so 49% of women, ath these are atheist women now, tell us they like to read erotic novels to get, to get themselves off, I guess, with or without my vibrator. Uh, films and DVDs with a plot. The women want a plot in their DVDs. 40% 40, 40 said they like just pictures, I guess in Playgirl or Playboy magazine, I don't, that kind of thing. And the internet shorts, 36.5% of our respondents said they like internet shorts. Now, if you don't know what an internet short, it's like 10 minutes on the, just long enough to get off and get back to work. Kind of a, kind of a real short, but, but explicit and fast. Okay, I want you to keep in mind what these four are, because look at this. What the men, what do men like? They like the internet shorts. You know, get it, get it out, get it off, and get back to work. 71%, 69% like pictures. Uh, DVDs with a plot. And, you know, guys don't like to read. That, look at that. Erotic novels. If you look at the, at the, the layout of men against women in this chart, they're exactly reversed. The women like the erotic novels. The men don't get off on erotic novels near as much. But it's kind of interesting. And there's, again, biological reasons why some of these things are happening here uh, that I don't have time to go into uh, today. So is there a difference in the beginning of porn use? So many religions say you shouldn't use porn. You're going to help you use porn. So now we're going to go back and we're going to look at porn use by religiosity. People who are very raised really, really, really religious, do they have less porn use than those who aren't? And here's what we found. Most religions teach against porn. So what's the, what's the results of that? Well, beginning over here, the least religious is on this part right here. The most religious is down here. There's, we have people at five years old telling us they started using porn down here. All right. I, whatever. Uh, so, but we really get into numbers uh, here. About 9 to 12, we can see that there's not much difference between the most religious and the least religious kids in the use of porn. But the least religious are using it more. The blue ones are the least religious. So we can see least religious kids are using porn more than the most religious kids. Now looky here, at 13 to 15, they're starting to even out. By 19 to 21, the most religious kids are falling, are, are gaining on the, the least religious kids. By the time, by the time uh, our sample gets to be 21 years of age, men, uh, men, both religious and non-religious, are using porn at equal rates. And by the time 30 years old, women are using porn at equal rates. Women are low, slow starters here. But by 30, they're using it at equal rates too. In other words, all that religious training you got as a kid is having zero effect on your use of pornography. Now, once again, every, if, if you've seen a book called A Billion Wicked Thoughts, great book, they, a couple of... Stanford uh, computer guys found, found the same thing. They found that, okay, where's the highest porn use in the United States? Utah and Mississippi. I work hard to make Kansas come up, but I haven't gotten this there yet, okay? <laughs> so you look at all of these, everything up here says the same thing our research shows, that religious people actually use porn more than uh, non-religious people do. But both of us use porn. And let's be frank, when you're using porn, you're masturbating to porn. People aren't using porn, they're using it to entertain themselves. So, we got some really tough uh, responses, as I said, and I wanna read a couple of them to you. Uh, first, after, after, I'm not afraid to have sex now, this, this person says, I don't feel guilty about masturbating and I don't feel bad anymore about having sucked my friend's cock. On a side note, I would like to mention that he was the preacher's son of the church I was attending. 
There was a large space of time, this woman reports, between becoming sexually active and becoming non-religious. During that time, I put myself at unnecessary risk of disease and pregnancy. While I was religious, guilt kept me from taking basic precautions like birth control or condom use. To me, using any sort of contraceptive was tantamount to admitting that I was planning for and indeed desirous of sexual activities. Deciding not to use contraception allowed me to convince myself that my pleasure was a side effect of fulfilling my boyfriend's desire for sexual activity. That is the very story of abstinence-only education. That's what abstinence-only education causes. It doesn't stop the sex, but it makes it more risky. And the evidence is shown all over the United States, as I showed earlier in the University of Georgia report that, that I mentioned. So within our sample, there's evidence for all these things. Evidence for <laughs> uh, that your life, your sex life improves if you leave religion. There's evidence that you should not marry a religious person. If they're very religious, it's even worse. The more religious you are, the worse your sex life is going to be, ultimately. And if you're going to marry a religious person, make sure they're an Episcopalian or a Unitarian or something <laughs> like that. Because we found that the spouse's religiosity, if your, spou if your spouse's religiosity today, you're an atheist, but your spouse's religiosity is an 8, 9, or a 10, then you are 75% likely to report a very poor 1, 2, or 3 sex life. In other words, if you've got a really, really religious spouse and you're an atheist, you don't have a sex life, or you have a real, you're masturbating a lot, probably. So relationships are, are really disrupted. Sexual relationships are disrupted by this, um, this issue. What about so, divorce rate? Uh, well, there's lower to the re we didn't look at divorce rate, but the research shows that divorce rate is higher among Baptists. Baptists have among the highest divorce rates. Atheists and Mormons uh, have much lower divorce rates. Utah Mormons, specifically. So sexual guilt doesn't seem, what we also found that sexual guilt doesn't seem to change anybody's behavior. You can teach kids as much guilt as you want, all but biology is going to happen. You are going to have sexual urges and you're going to act on them. So here's a quote that I, I, I stand on, that you can take religion out of sex, but you can't take sex out of religion. If you take sex out of religion, it collapses. Imagine the Pope waking up one day and saying, wow, I had the best wet dream last night. I think we'll make masturbation legal in the Catholic Church. No, religion has to have sex to keep you infected with their God virus. You might say, well, I'm not religious, so what's this all got to do with me? Well, we're swimming in a very polluted, religiously infected pool. And I mean, even here in Canada, you guys are getting, you know, you're getting the, the backwash from the United States, unfortunately. So I wrote Sex and God to try and build a framework for us to reframe what non-religious sexuality should look like and be. And I wanted to celebrate positive, natural sexuality and try to identify what that might be for an atheist, for a secularist, for an agnostic or a humanist. I wanted to encourage seculars to be proud of our sexuality, just like the gay community is proud of theirs. I love what the gay community has done. They say, we don't give a shit what you think. We are out here, we're proud. And I think atheists should be proud of our sexuality as well, and we should show it in many ways. But I see many secularists are still infected with religious ideas about sex. So here's the a, here's a deal. If you feel guilt or shame about your, your sexual behavior or about your sexuality, you're probably infected with religious ideas about that. We act like Christians. Why the hell should we act like Christians? We're humanists. We're atheists. So we hide our sexuality, for example, or we pretend that we don't do it. And I never masturbate. Uh, or we let religionists condemn other people without challenging them. Or we act ashamed of our sexuality in some ways like this. I mean, I, 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 I talked to an owner, not this one, but an owner that had one of these, and she said, a woman owned this video, adult video store, she said this was the best thing ever happened to her business. When they put that up, her business just went out the roof. It's a much bigger advertisement than that is. So you might, here's the deal, you might be a Christian redneck, you know, you know Christian red, you know, rednecks, Jeff Foxworthy. You might be a Christian secularist, or you might be a Christian atheist, if you feel guilty about masturbating. You might be a Christian secularist if you feel shame admitting you use pornography. You might be a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your children about sex and sexuality. What's the problem here? Why are we reluctant, 38%, to talk to our kids about sex and sexuality? You might be a Christian uh, secularist or atheist if you feel shame about 
If, if you shame other people, especially women, nothing pisses me off more than see internet shaming going on among atheists. That's the stupidest thing. We have no reason to be doing slut shaming and things like that within our community. You might be a, 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 a Christian atheist if you have difficulty talking to your spouse or your partner about sexual fantasies or things that turn you on. Now, I am not saying your partner has to participate in that fantasy or what turns you on, but what's the problem here? You can't even talk to the person that's most intimate, most important in your life about things that turn you on. That's religious guilt infecting your brain. And if you leave here and start talking to your spouse more openly, I will feel wonderful. Please let me know. Because I think that's what we should be doing as atheists. We shouldn't be buying into this Christian bullshit around sexuality. Uh, I think sex is religion's weak spot. If you take sex out, it collapses. The most liberal religions who are sex positive and gay friendly, they're dying. I mean, even if all the gays in the world came into those churches, they'd probably still be dying. Because sex is what motivates, uh, creates guilt and brings you back to church. You know, I'm going to teach you the guilt, and then you have to come back to get rid of it. It keeps you coming back. So I think we should be out about our sexuality, and we should respect other people's sexuality and the choices they make. So you could say things like, sure, I fornicate, just like many, many religious people do. Sure, I masturbate. Don't you? Let's normalize this. This is normal human behavior, just like it is among chimpanzees. Sure, I enjoy pornography, just like most religious people. They just can't admit it. You did know that the highest use of pornography is in the most religious places, by zip code almost. <laughs> <laughs> so let's frame their behavior. Because control of women's bodies and sexuality is the one key to successful religious infection. All the major patriarchal religions, and almost all the major religions are patriarchal, want to control women's bodies. That's the focus. We need to challenge them in new ways. And we can do that by saying things like, I take birth control because I like sex in or outside of marriage, just like Newt Ginrich and Rush Limbaugh do. <laughs> and these suckers have had dozens of, dozens of lovers, and how many wives have they had? And this guy's a, a fundamentalist Catholic now, telling he's, he's screwed hundreds of women, and he's telling us you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. You have seen the picture of his wife, right? She looks like a robot. I mean, something really. So I'm not a Christian, and I don't have to act like a Christian. And I want you to think about that. Where in your life do you act like a Christian and create shame with your body, and you, you act shameful about what you do? I'm not a Christian, and I don't have to act like one, and I want you to feel the same. I am a secular sexual. That's what I am. I am secular and I'm sexual, and that means I'm not a Catholic sexual, I'm not a Baptist sexual, I'm not a Muslim sexual, I'm not a Mormon sexual. Secular sexuality has a value system that values other people's choices, values mine, does not show shame, is proud of who they are, and helps other people liberate themselves from the shame that religion brings. Thank you.